All right, everyone, welcome back to Central Coast Disc Golf. This is the Innova Open at the 28th Annual Texas State Disc Golf Championship. I am Nate Perkins, and I'm here with my good friend and fellow native Texan, Connor O'Reilly. You guys, it is moving day. The temperatures got hotter and the play got way hotter. Yesterday we saw seven birdies averaged on the course. Today it went up to 11. So these players looking to make a move, position themselves for that final round. We see Calvin Heimberg, it's currently the solo leader going into this round. Kyle Klein, Joel Freeman, and Ezra Aderhold will be rounding out our card. Yeah, definitely a bright and sunny day here in Houston. We had a complete change in the humidity dropping down to 15 percent for this round and it was it was dead calm i mean I, these flags are not going to be moving at all and when it's calm like this connor i almost feel like these baskets are too big yeah i think days like today where players just get to be comfortable on the greens they're not really thinking about wind reads they're just thinking about committing to their stroke Welcome to the Innova Open of the 28th Annual Texas State Disc Golf Championship. This is your lead card. Tee off first. Representing Innova Champion Disc, please welcome Calvin Heinberg. Yeah, and like Nate said, that 15% humidity, I almost didn't want to trust it, just knowing how humid Houston always is, but throughout the day, the... The grip stayed pretty consistent. Let's see if Calvin can match that amazing shot from round one. Oh, it's just gone. <laughs> it's past the Mando again. All right, next on the box, representing Innova Champion Disc, please welcome Joel Freeman. We know, we know Joel is one of the most colorfully dressed players on the tour. He's got his strawberry shirt today, fresh pair of Brooks running shoes. He puts himself wow. well past Calvin. Of Calvin's. If you didn't know much about Joel's game, he does have the pop. Representing Discmania, please welcome Kyle Klein. Kind of getting on top of that cloud breaker there. Oh, not yet. Yeah, that's a good bit of fortune. Rounding out our lead card, representing Discraft. Please welcome Ezra Aderhold. how much power is Mr. Ezra Aderhold has. This one needs to drag over to the right, though. Wow, and pretty much a misfire, but puts enough rotation to keep it in bounds. Going to be a very tricky spot. Still has a mando tree to try to get around. And Kyle, the tree Kyle hit was out of bounds. Kicked him back in. What a break. He's looking to get creative. And we know how much he likes a Heiser release. Yeah, such a massive level of trust displayed by Kyle right there. So I believe Ezra actually okay. missed the mandatory. This is the drop zone. Not a routine up and down. This is low ceiling. Yeah, you got about 300 feet from here, but like Nate said, the ceiling is low enough to where that typical zone that Ezra played there, you know, might feel a little bit pinched compared to just having unlimited ceiling. No. 
Just one low hanger right there that kept Calvin from a park job. And the spotter said that this is the best drive of the weekend so far. Up in Calvin's day one drive. Calvin threw another great one today, but yeah, Joel just skipped 80 feet past it. That was amazing. Yeah, just a little hesitant out of Kyle there, and understandably, hole one, it's a tough hole, and not necessarily one that you feel like you have to birdie to shoot hot. And we had pretty much a 180 degree wind direction change today, but like Nate said, it's pretty dead out there as well, so. Yeah, completely different day here at Brock Park, I mean, you said it averaged 11 birdies the, for the field? 11 holes played under par, whereas day one it was seven. So, yeah. Quite oh, a big. okay. 11 holes played under par. Yeah. I feel like for Joel has to be the best player with like the least recognition, I feel like, on the tour. He, I mean, he won Silver Series last year. He was in the top 10 consistently top 20 almost all the time and he's one of those players that just like skirted the feature cards a little bit and you know if you don't know his game he's super well-rounded forehand backhand combo really likes to rip over on the overstable plastic let it fight out and he's kind of reworked his putt recently from nose down to nose up and it's looking solid hole two is a par three 363 feet kind of your classic valley shot but we do have a tree right off the tee to kind of keep your height limited really suits a forehand if you can drive it flat and beat this hazard bunker here to the right the straight backhand if you feel real good with it is also available and we do have out of bounds wrapping maybe 40 feet behind it and left to try to navigate oh, beautiful forehand from Joel testing that ceiling right out of the gate I believe that that is a PD2 yeah that would make sense Calvin going with one of his signature halo destroyers here yeah I feel like there's like two angles you'll see coming out of the oh my gosh great side hill skip there from Calvin I thought like there's two angles you'll see. You'll see kind of the really overstable on a little bit of turn here. And you'll see the flat shot out of the kind of medium stability disc. I feel like with as touchy as the kind of hyzer flip can get here, most players stable up just to avoid that OB line on the left. And this is a prototype DD3 from Kyle. That thing's probably been in his bag for a while then, huh? Yeah, a couple seasons now, I think. Actually... Asked him if he needed a backup. Told him I got a few laying around <laughs> that I might not be using anymore. <laughs> and Ezra, a little bit of nose up on that, but just shows you guys the power he has. Gets it into the bullseye. And these guys making short work of hole two. Unfortunate miss by Kyle, but to see four shots inside the circle is definitely not very common here. This is our lead card, however, so... It's not like the it's the first season that Calvin's been throwing good forehands, but his forehand has never looked better. Yeah, I feel like there, there used to be more times where he would elect for that straight shot with the eagle um, instead, kind of starting to go for as many hyzers as he can. Ezra tapping in his CTP. Kyle, just a little bit of a misfire on the green there. Is that Zeus there from? I believe so. Yeah, it could be a Zeus. A little bit of wobble out the hand, but stabilizes. All right, hole three, it's a par four, 870 feet. A little bit of a ceiling off the tee. Players can opt to go with kind of a 
hyzer out wide that stands up a little bit and tests the OB on the right. Did you say it's playing slightly uphill on this I, second? I feel like the second flat? one, it feels like it feels like it is slightly uphill. It looks yeah. like it's flat in your mind, but it seems like when you when you range it and then you throw it, it almost always seems to come up a little bit short. And I think uh, definitely playing some mind games on these players. If you if you don't throw this hyzer out to the right here, you kind of have to test this low ceiling, and it's hard to really cover as much ground as you need to score. Unless you're one of these four cats right here, and you really are just getting the disc up to speed and out to that 500-foot mark. Yeah, we saw some sick drives from the lead card here yesterday. Let's see how they attack here today. Calvin putting the move on this doesn't really get it to move right but he has enough pace to really bite around that corner and gets a nice check skip a lot of the ground play out here is pretty slow but there are some faster patches that you'll have to kind of understand where they are throughout the course this is not one of those holes though and Ezra just a stock hyzer to a great landing zone most players are Looking to flex it a little bit to get there. Kind of four different ways to to get the driver up to speed, but all very efficient. Yeah, Calvin kind of going more of that flat driven angle we see out of him. Kyle trying to get a little flex, a little extra distance, and Joel and Ezra playing that. Standard hyzer, not trying to worry about the disc moving right. So I think Kyle's right, right around 425 into the into the green. Got a slight uphill run up. Looks like he doesn't necessarily love it. And yeah, like we said, 425 for Kyle Klein is usually a pretty routine distance, but this one just little bit uphill and I think it uh, makes you tense up a little bit maybe not swing as relaxed and freely as some other shots that's yeah, so I was wondering if we were gonna see the ball because Calvin actually had one of the most intense stops on a throw like he was full on throwing Connor and somehow he tripped and held on to the disc Okay, so it was a trip from him, and he wow. yeah, his back foot went into one of the potholes, and yeah. he said if he didn't stop, Calvin was going to throw it three o'clock. Oh yeah, no, I, this is one of those courses like we mentioned yesterday, where every run up you need to measure out your footwork and see if there are any big holes to worry about because there's crawfish, there's sandy ground, and it just yeah, there seems to be a. It might look smooth out there, but you could be one foot could be three inches lower than the next, and it could throw you off. This is probably one of the scariest baskets to putt on throughout the course. Yeah. Look at this. This is so scary right now. Oh, no. This is going to need to sit. And I don't think it is. As they're still watching it. I know all too well about the rollaway on this one. I tried to lay up from about twice as far as Ezra. Same angle. Put a little too much on it. And it just rolled no. to 100 feet. <laughs> And this comebacker from where he's at is almost going to be a throw distance. Normally he could probably put this on flat ground, but. And we're just going to go ahead and give some respect to Ian Anderson. Worst words in disc golf. You're still out. <laughs> yeah, you never want to be the one to be putting and then still have another putt. Always a very pressure mounting situation. You got to be careful when you're giving it that run back up not to hit the metal too softly. And yeah, this has to be one of the steepest slopes we've seen on a green on the tour, honestly. That is the type of birdie putt that you want on this hole. Nothing, nothing more than 20 feet. 
really impressive considering the reset. Yeah, I think it just shows how strong Calvin is mentally as a player to be able to reset and then find a, that positive headspace again and go execute. I think a lot of players catch that reset and they feel a little bit frustrated or whatnot. And Calvin just showing the kind of champion, champion's mind that he has. I think we're going to get a good look at it right here. No. Oh my gosh! Never seen anything like it. I thought Connor. this was. A, I thought the throw was happening. That is incredible. How did he hold on to the disc I, right there? I overheard Ezra asking Calvin, and Calvin says he has no idea. It was like by his fingertips. Grip strength on alligator jaws status. What's up, Calvin? This looks perfect. Off the basket. Now it's rolling. It's headed for the OB. This needs to sit. Oh my goodness, it's safe! Right on the line. She's gonna have about a 30 foot putt for the win. Okay, here we go. The putt is up. Boom, it's in! Strong side with authority. What an incredible moment. Yes! The Savant is a little less overstable. Thunderbird. So if you don't have quite the power to throw a Thunderbird, you can throw the Savant and you can throw it farther. Hole four, very unique par three, teeing off inbounds, but having to fly over out of bounds to get to the island green. This one's a very skinny window to come in. If you push it too far left, out of bounds, it's going to find you quick. You really have to test this stand of trees on the right here, especially if you're going to throw something overstable and hope to get a little bit of ground play back into this basket. Today, we did have tailwind maybe slightly off the right, so definitely a better wind than day one for this hole. This no, looks inside. Way early. He knew it right out of his hand. Joel playing a little bit lower, going to need some ground play, but he gets up to the flat where you usually do get it. And he plays that one very well. You don't see discs behind this basket too often. Oh, it's wide, Connor. Yeah, going to need a lot of ground action for Kyle. He gets it. Just enough. Whew. I think that's his creator series cloud breaker. A little bit on the straighter side for a cloud breaker. Oh, that's Ezra maybe going with the onyx here, which I think if you have the power to throw a disc up, catches some of the cage. Wow, Ezra. I feel like last year he had a he had two or three aces on the tour. Almost just started the silver silver event season with another one. sure they probably couldn't hear it hit the cage but I'm, I know they heard the roar of the crowd and they had to know it was close and Kyle's still just not ready to get on the board yet man yeah just a little out of sorts with the putter and Joel gets to a great position off the tee for that birdie Joel's moving three and, through four. Yeah, Joel's actually going to take the lead here with Calvin in line to take a bogey. Kyle, four pars through four. Definitely not the start he wants. Let's see if he can mentally find some focus and put it close. Yeah, this one does feel like a two or a four hole. You rarely will see the threes happen, or at least a lot less than those twos and fours. Ezra 
Ezra. That might be a, that's probably a raptor, actually. Definitely not Onyx. There's a look at that Huck face, bottom lip bit. Ezra's signature. All right, hole five, couple of options here. We're flying through the left option. More of a mid-range turnover on this left gap, and a few of our players are gonna opt for that low ceiling hyzer play on the right side, and then another treacherous green, this one with OB at the bottom of it, kind of the double punishment here on the fifth. And did Nate Perkins say a mid-range turnover down the forehand gap? The game is changing, and Nate's backhand is coming around, you guys. you got to love it. <laughs> and Joel airs it just far enough to get a little bit of ground play. If you play it short and low on that line to the right, then ground play is just not available. You really have to get to circle's edge to get any skip. Yeah, I think that's Firebird from Joel. This is Raptor from Ezra. Uh, just a little short and another basket that you really just don't want to putt on. Yeah, that's another one you want to be within 20 feet of. Really going to test your guts. Kyle going to need that one to stay in the air just a bit longer, but he did have a great line on it. Let's see what Mr. Calvin Heimberg is choosing. That backhand with the Draco. Yeah, so I actually misspoke yesterday. I had some some of our lovely fans uh, correct me. This is actually a champion Firebird. All right, the Firebird. Maybe a little more overstable than his Dracos? Or? The fans, they really don't want you to say the wrong disc, which I, I understand. Good on you guys for knowing. Good I understand. On you I appreciate you for letting me know. I think, uh, would you rather us be try to be specific, or would you rather us just say very overstable nine speed? I, I, I mean... I think there's a balance to find. We'll try to do better. And we were speaking on the fact that it's just really funny when some players know like the player like a player's whole bag. It's just I don't know if there's too many sports out there where people are so in tune with their competitors like equipment. Yeah, especially if, if you play practice rounds with somebody, I feel like we all get reads off each other, we ask each other what we're throwing just so we can make our best calculations and I think it's only I think it can only be helpful to you to know what other people are throwing sometimes. Calvin puts it close, able to capitalize for birdie. Yeah, and like we said on this one, if you don't land closer than 30 feet short of the basket, you're not going to get any ground play here, and you're going to have a scary putt. Now that's this one little scrappy crepe myrtle behind the basket too, is where if you're just behind, you got to straddle around that. It may not look like it, but there are a couple leaps on it, so it is still alive. And Kyle Klein, really looking to get off that par train. <laughs> Joel, going to give us the Fooled reverse me. dunk for a second. Yeah, if you guys didn't know, Connor has a basketball background and his brother is actually a professional basketball player playing in over in Europe isn't that right yeah my younger brother Liam has just finished or he's finishing out his fifth season in Europe so basketball runs deep in my veins it was my first love but disc golf has me by the reins now and hole <laughs> six is a par four out of bounds both ways this one really snakes to the right throughout the flight you can choose to be Extra aggressive to give yourself a sight line to the basket on the approach, which I think is going to give you a big advantage here. I think you can see turnover fairways, mid-range off the tee. Also, those high stock hyzers with the forehand will work as well. Let's see how these players choose to attack. Looks like Eagle out of Calvin. Is that, uh, Eagle McMahon is just messed, messed up this golf language with every time i say eagle out of calvin it feels wrong but <laughs> yeah <laughs> shouldn't i i'm totally with you and you know this this tee shot with some wind can be nervy but i mean it's just dead calm during this round and yeah if there if, was any wind it'd be off the kind of the back of these players today so mm -hmm. really not going to have almost any effect on the effect on this flight other than maybe just slightly stabling it Yeah, 
Yeah, it was so still for this second round. You could hear the you could hear the woodpeckers in the distance high up in the pine trees. I yeah, actually, I saw a big one fly across the fairway at one yeah, point. Yeah, I saw a, a big a big pileated woodpecker over by the pond on 18 for the FPO. Kyle getting uber aggressive with that turnover. And uh, Ezra's looked tight, but he had the power to get to a good spot. Joel is going to have the toughest position. Let's see if he can place this forehand where he wants. And this a little whistle from the Gator out of the, out of that one. One of the few discs that will whistle. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw the Prodigy A3 do that. I was just like, what the heck is going on? It does it so consistently, too. Yeah. Ezra going with that color shift zone presented with OTB discs, I believe, and puts that one in nicely and gets some gentle ground play. Going to have to straddle out from there and get a putt out of the bushes. Kyle also going with a slower disc, it looks like. Probably some kind of tactic. And yeah, just outside the bullseye. You put this drive inbounds, you're really looking to give yourself a birdie here. I think this one should be pretty routine for anyone who's on top of their game today. And I believe that's a Toro from Calvin. Yeah, it's one of those holes I wish I would have spent a little more time practicing. I think there's so many options you can take, and it takes some time to really figure out which one's going to be best for you. Just as far as the this approach into the green? I think my, mainly the, the drive. I think okay. understanding how aggressive and what angle I really could hit. Because I think, like I said, having that sight line on the basket and being able to throw you know, your harp, your zone, your tactic type of disc is going to be very advantageous first coming in with that overstable fairway. Looking at a potential star frame here. Ever, ever since Greg Barsby told me that you can only have stars stars with the five card, I just, you know, I'm calling them. I was calling them squares for a while, but we deserve no. better than that. So we're diamonds. So we're diamond frames. Oh, I love that, man. Greg Barsby. Triple G. And Kyle Klein finally gets on the board with his first birdie. Let's look for him to continue moving up the board now. Is that one of those new? I think that's the Horizon breakers? DD1, okay. I believe. I was going to say Kyle busting it out early on everybody. And here we have a look. Joel Freeman and Calvin Heimberg have put themselves above the rest with three strokes on the players that are log jammed, tied for third. All right, hole seven. Little speed check here, just 294 left to right, shaping par three. Couple of late trees to contend with. One of the par threes out here that it shapes from left to right, but it doesn't really shape up great for the forehand. Much better for this kind of putter mid range turnover. Oh, Calvin. Pushing that one a little too straight. For a second, I thought all three of those par threes that they mixed into the course were 294 feet, but only two of them are. The other one's 282 feet. Okay. But like Nate said, they all fit forehand and backhand, but I feel like the backhand and ground play seems superior on all three of them. They pretty much shape almost identical. Oh, that over. oh. just too straight for Joel. And Joel is kind of known for being very audible player kind of talking to himself uh, after he throws good or bad you'll you'll hear him t talking to himself about his shots yeah there's definitely some players who I don't know it, it makes them feel better I guess just to get it out instead of internalizing it and there's other players like Calvin Heimberg who you know he might be having the best round of his life and you only hear about 12 words out of him and this is just that's just Kyle's bread and butter right there that's an MD1 and just the body English that he puts on that. Calvin, Calvin. straddle. Wow. To get the power on that without having to jump. 80 footer. That is straddle stance. If Calvin Heimberg is going to be sinking putts like this all weekend, uh, it's going to be 
It's going to be tough to match him. Get some love from Ezra there. Well deserved. And Joel from a similar spot. Calvin, Calvin cracks me up in the way that he doesn't, like, he's not cracked. He has yet to crack a smile, Connor. <laughs> he like, oh, Ezra, amazing. Jams in the jumper. Nice driven putt to the low side. But yeah, Calvin, at this point, he like, he's got to keep, he's got to keep up the, the act or whatever. It's not an act because it's, it's, it's him. But yeah. uh, he's got to keep it up. So I feel like some, sometimes I'm like, is it, does it take extra energy to, to maintain that stoicness that he has? Or is he just that I'm much of a boss? Well. Uh, you know, I'm I'm working with the Disc Golf Network for this event, so I'm walking throughout this round, watching every shot. You know, commenting on the broadcast, and I almost want to walk up to him, and be like, "Come on, dude! You know you want to smile. You just cracked an 80 footer on him, Calvin." Yeah, I like trying to poke Calvin here and there. I think people like that who who you know they have so much character, but sometimes don't really let you see it unless you really intimate with them I, I i like to really poke at those people and try to see the other side of them and ezra does just enough to stick that birdie okay so we walk across a epic probably 330 foot bridge over this greens bayou and yeah it almost feels like you're turning to the back nine just with a really long walk almost mm -hmm. you know it kind of sections the course off and we have this massive par five just under 1200 feet you really got to push it as far as you can off the tee. The second shot, the key is to beat this group of trees right here. And you will give yourself a pretty optimal approach. Wide open here on the left. No height restrictions, really. If you push yourself to the right, you'll have to play some kind of skip shot. But uh, definitely a hole that these first two shots are really going to dictate how easy that birdie is going to be. Yeah, there's a couple massive bridges spanning the creek or river by you here and uh yeah they're definitely got to be millions of dollars and you can see all the people filing across it right now yeah it's a good look at it right there and i actually had to check my eyes looking down and seeing a monster catfish surface i don't know if you've heard word of that one that's kind of stuck right there below the bridge but i've seen when i was walking yesterday i saw in the rapids area off to the left like some huge movement and i couldn't tell what it was but it, it would make sense that it might have been a cat like that. Ezra just catches a little bit of that tree, drops inbounds though, and it's going to be a tricky spot. He's going to have yeah. a lot of low ceilings to have to punch the disc under. There's just something so fluid about the way Kyle throws it. Mm -hmm. Just you can see just the kinetic chain, and you can see the lag and the whip. And I think for some of you guys who struggle with the reach back or struggle with rounding, watching a player like Joel who really just leaves the disc in place, runs up and then pulls through very simply, it can be a uh, something good to learn from. Yeah, super unfortunate lie here. He's trying to move quite a bit from left to right and doesn't quite have the initial ceiling to do so. I think right now he's debating, do I really need to throw a roller? Do I want to go for this hole? And let's see what decision he makes. Looks like maybe going with that same disc since he's marking it. Yeah, I think electing for just the more kind of mature straight shot. I think the roller could get you optimal position here, but there are just so many more variables when you lay the disc on the ground. Especially when we know about 300 feet up, there's a colony of crawfish numbering in the hundreds. Yeah. I don't know if you guys at home have ever seen... Do you call it a tunnel? Crawfish tunnel? Yeah, I call it a little chimney. I yeah, think that's a the crawfish chimney. But yeah, when, they, when they're when they burrowing out their little tunnels, they, they kind of come to the surface and push some of the mud out of the way, and it creates like a little chimney 
almost. And uh, there's a bunch of those throughout the course. And they're sure. like right behind Joel's disc yeah. here. When you get close enough, you'll see. And if you get down to ground level, it looks like just a little city full of towers almost. Kyle with another very driven shot down that right side. He's going to be in prime position. Very short up shot, probably 200 feet into the pin here. It almost scares me. It comes out so hot <laughs> and, so low hard and, and low, look at but this. then it just it got an extra stays 80 up. feet off the skip. I feel the same way sometimes when I'm watching Calvin and just something doesn't look right, and then the disc is just flying good every time. Yeah, it looks like the tree was blocked from our camera view right there. Ezra caught it, unfortunately, and yeah, he's not going to be happy with that. I'm sure he had a pretty solid size window there. I think that extra power that you try to get on some of these long skip shots, though, can make you pull it right the way Ezra did. <clears throat> that late wrist action that Joel has to, like, get on top of the disc, he he loves forcing over stable discs on that forehand line. Yeah, I mean, he kind of, like, owned that we saw on FPO coverage in terms of just, like, yeah. Joel plays more force over shots than almost anybody in the NPO yeah. division. Backhand and That's forehand. a good comparison. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing some FPO commentary this year, so I've been getting to know the ladies' games a little more. It's fun to try to make some little comparisons here and there. We all know if comparisons are the thief of joy, but we all like them still. So. Kyle plays this one textbook. You see Nate back there staying protected from the sun. Definitely a day where you had to put that sunscreen on if you're going to be out all day. Calvin just catches a little bit of ground play. Yeah, going a little deeper than he wanted there. Yeah. Ezra, another yeah. right side pocket, two in a row for him. What a way to play the hole, Connor. I mean, every shot he threw was not his intended line, and then he cashes in from 50 to save the par. The short game is the great equalizer, you guys. I mean, Calvin staying strong. Those type of putts are the ones you have to have if you want to win an event nowadays because the field is just getting tighter and tighter. You know, going into the week, Connor, it was kind of hard to get a gauge on what a good score was going to be. You know, all the practice rounds, there were ripping, ripping winds out of the southeast. And Friday, pretty windy and rainy, but today, just dead calm. And I think at this point on the Pro Tour, no course is safe, huh? Absolutely. Like like Nate said, we had 20-plus mile per hour winds for a lot of practice, so it felt like, you know, if you could get to that 6 through 9 mark, you'd probably be sitting towards the top, but... We know when the conditions get calm, double digits, doesn't matter what the track is, the players are going to find a way. All right, hole nine. Probably one of the more dangerous holes out here. It's only 360 feet, but this OB is tight. Left, right, and deep. You kind of have to push a forehand right up the OB line on the left. And then you can just see this Spanish moss creating that low ceiling. Calvin puts a good move on this forehand. Looked like maybe a fairway driver, which I think if you have the power to go fairway driver here, it can really help reduce some of that ground play, which can be very fast on the screen. And I think he's intentionally playing that 10 meter short. Yeah, the way this one just narrows down as you go deep, I think it is one of those holes where it's smart to play the short side of the green. Oh, and don't stretch yourself up with the out-of-bounds possibility. Joel, just a little too much turn there. Going to get held up. Most likely going to have to just settle for a bogey, unless he wants to give us a highlight.
Ezra also looking at like he chose that raptor shot and he's testing that out of bounds. Oh, just finds it barely. Nice little nose up toss right there. Yeah, you could tell he tried to give that one a soft bid. And so I think the spotter mistakenly gave Ezra OB and he walks up and finds out that he's in fact inbounds. He he got you, Ezra. Wow. And Calvin just continuing his dominant putting. Really been catching everything he's been looking at from edge of circle and, and deeper. Wow, it's five in a row. I mean, and I, he's really just had one one misfire on four early hyzer. I mean, one he... And four feels like one of those holes where it just, you know, you can be off by a fraction and it happens. You almost mm -hmm. expect it. And yeah, hole one, he was prime position, just didn't yeah. quite get up and down, caught the one branch to beat. Calvin's right there on the verge of being nine through nine. Going to be hard for the competitors to keep up on a track like this that suits his low ceiling driven skill set. If he's oh, continuing to that. catch these spots. I just love watching that, man. So thankful to be here with you guys on Central Coast Disc Golf. Thanks so much for being here, Connor. Yeah, it's been a lot you're... of fun. I'm super excited to be able to dip into the commentary a little more this year as well as continue trying to play the best golf I can. And here's another look at that leaderboard through nine. Calvin, six down with the one bogey. AB with the hottest round through nine. He moves himself up to tied third. There's a big jam still. Three players sitting there. Luke Sampson, Nicholas Antela, AJ Carey rounding out that top 10. Thanks so much for joining us here on Central Coast Disc Golf, and we will see you soon for the back nine.